Yep, loving spirit and, and discerning. We are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be di- restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. See your lips moving. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome? It's one of those uh, youth songs we learned that I, I still think was pretty good. <laughs> We're one in the spirit. We're one in the spirit. Happy Father's Day. Fathers, we give thanks for fathers and for everybody who acts in the role of father. We give thanks and um, happy Juneteenth. Um, if we say happy, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, um, I'm appreciating. I'm appreciating learning the history that I wasn't taught as a young person. Um, you know, I sometimes uh, white people react to something called black history as though You know, it shouldn't be that way. And it's right, it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't have black history and white history. We should just have history. But unfortunately, I and we weren't taught the history that included our black sisters and brothers. So we have to learn it, and it's a good thing. Uh, Galveston, Texas, June 19th, 1865, when the black slave population learned that they had been freed over two years earlier but the truth was kept from them. And it took the finishing of the Civil War for the Union armies to get that far south and west to let them know that they were free. June 19th, Juneteenth, Juneteenth. So we honor that as well. Father's Day, Juneteenth as well. As well as the Sabbath, time of rest, time of reflection, time of meditation and prayer, time of coming together as one. Welcome to those of you who are joining us via Zoom as well, as those of you who are here in the room. Peace, peace, peace be with you. Not as the world gives, but as God gives. We have two uh, hymns that would be I think pretty familiar, but not entirely to all of us, so we'll just uh, go through the tunes. And they are number 843, uh, no, I'm sorry, Loving Spirit 397, Loving Spirit 397. Sixty six in the singing.
please rise with me if you're able. And we begin with the prayer of confession on the front of the hymnal. Front of the bulletin. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Praise the one who breaks the darkness. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Spirit, 397. God is in you. Loving spirit, like a father, like a mother, like a friend, like a lover, like an advocate, as one who is on our side to increase our oneness in love. The one who sustains, the one who supports, the one who breathes life in and out of us. Loving spirit, loving spirit. Shared spirit, spirit of us all. We are one in the spirit. And we give thanks. Light eternal. Shine. Shine on us. Advocate to help us without condition. Be with us in all of our decision making. In all of our creating and co-creating. In all of our relating. In every choice, in every moment in every split second, be with us to lead us to wholeness and to share your wholeness with us. Amen. Holy Gospel, Luke chapter 8. So 
somewhere in chapter 8. It's here. Here it is. I encourage you all to read Luke chapter 8, the entire chapter. It's amazing. It is just action-packed, action-packed. This is one part. After the calming of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, they arrive at the country of the Gerasenes, it's outside of Israel, which is opposite to Galilee. And as Yeshua stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Yeshua, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Yeshua, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Yeshua had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound in chains and shackles, but he would break the chains and be driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Yeshua then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Then he begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on a hillside, a large herd of pigs was feeding. And the spirits begged Jesus not to let them enter these. Oh, begged Jesus to let them enter these pigs. So he gave them permission. And then the demons left the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and drowned. Now, when the swine herders saw what had happened, they ran off and told it to the city and the country. And then people came out to see what in the world had happened. And when they came to Yeshua, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Yeshua, clothed and in his right mind. And the people were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Yeshua to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. And so he got in the boat and returned. And the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might Go with him. But Yeshua sent him away, saying, Return to your house and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Yeshua had done for him. The Gospel of God. Yes? Volume up? Okay, better? Okay, you check. Here we go. This got me thinking this story is a wonder wonderful story. I think this story is just uh, amazing and fabulous. And we um, do the story injustice, I think, if we in our modern sensibility begin to wonder about what in the world those people were thinking with their demonology or their understanding of what demons were in the spiritual realm. But I would argue that, well, two things. One is we really do, all of us, at least in our speech, 
believe in, in the spiritual realm, that which interacts with humans and is of human but beyond human and transpersonal. We speak that way. We have words that are powerful words in our language that suggest this, like possessed, what possessed you, what possessed me. I wonder what possessed me. Or muse, music. <clears throat> muse is a spiritual word. Muse is our spirits. And musicians and other artists, I think, are some of the most sensitive people to the spiritual influences in the world that are not just human, not just the result of our individual humanity and chemistry and upbringing and education, but that there's something more, there's something that comes to us, there's something that inspires, another spiritual word, powerful spiritual word, inspire, spirit within, I'm inspired, or I'm dispirited, dispirited, I'm without spirit today. These are powerful words. And we do, we do say demonic. And we do say evil. And these have transpersonal connotations. Not just about individuals or the collection of individuals, but there's something else. There's some energetic presence that we sometimes feel. And the word that's used in the New Testament here for demon is actually the Greek word daimon, which can mean something diabolical, diabolical, which means to cro throw a cross. Diabolos, diabolical, means to throw a cross, to get thrown a curveball. So daimon can be something very, very good, like genius, which is the Latin translation of daimon, from the Greek to the, I didn't want to get all into the words today, but here I am. Some of you will appreciate this. Genius. But we can have an evil genius, yeah? We use that term too, genius, evil genius. And the artists among us, the creators, the creative ones, the inventors, the people often talk about inspiration and are crystal clear that our own individual personal agency is not all that's at work in the creative process. We are not strictly in control of what's going on with our own individual personal will. It's a both and process. It's dialogical. And in the mystery of the interaction between the individual or the group or the society and that which is, as they said in the ancient Greek world, numinous, that is, in the presence of the gods or the spirits or the daimons or the genie, genius, things happen. And they happen. And I would argue that there is no adequate moral vision of human life that does not account for and acknowledge the transpersonal and spiritual reality in which we all live and breathe. We end up with silly polarities like we have today. Either it's all individual responsibility and personal choice, or it's all transpersonal. It's all the influence of whatever happened to that person that created this circumstance. So the person is either 100% totally individually responsible and in control of what they do or they're victims. The devil made me do it, Flip Wilson used to say, jokingly. But of course, it's not either or, it's both and, is in so many things. And in the moral realm, it's a, almost always 
the full complexity of all these factors. So I was thinking about where the word possession has been used in my life, and my mother was fond of the phrase, what on earth possessed you? What on earth possessed you? And that would come in a variety of circumstances. I'm thinking about my friendship group in my neighborhood growing up. Most of the boys in that group were older than me, and they were wild. Um, I later learned that they came from rather, uh, uh, let's say, loose households where the parents were often absent and they could run feral and they had all kinds of toys that we all used and we had ideas that we could just run free with and those ideas uh, were sometimes really stupid like um, rock fights in the summertime instead of snowball fights rock fights because you know there, there was no snow so let's use rocks we have rock fights or BB gun wars or um, Let's go jump off that roof. Or let's tear the hood off of that old car in the junkyard, turn it upside down, tie a rope to the snowmobile, and get a bunch of guys on the, and go as fast as possible, go into turns, and then try to throw each other off with all the sharp things sticking up on the bottom of the hood. So, you know, I mean, people got hurt in my world. And uh, if, my, if, if my parents found out about it, um, they were not pleased, but my mother would say, what on earth possessed you? Well, I thought about that. What did possess me? Well, other people, my environment, their environment, you know, Natural hijinks. Curiosity about danger. What might happen. All of that, all mixed together. All of it, what possessed you? But also, if I happened to like, you know, do something that was a chore, but I wasn't asked to do the chore, she might say, what on earth possessed you? to do this kindness. What on earth possessed you? You see, we use it quite the same way. We use it quite the same way. This notion of something that's just more than ourselves, that influences with, in, with which we interact in every moment. Now, the interesting thing about the word daimon or demon is that it comes from the word originally to divide, to divide. So does the word decide, also. And we all know and understand because of our own experience, even if you're really young, that we create a life based on our decisions. But also those decisions are not just our decisions. I mean, there's a lot more to those decisions, but decisions in every moment can lead to the good. Decisions in the moment can lead to the evil. And we all have to decide as part of being moral, spiritual beings with some measure of free will. I think back on these friends of mine, these wild, rowdy boys, for the most part. And I reflect on what happened to them. Two of them that I know of uh, became very, very successful, educated, um, and from what I can tell, are leading, you know, relatively happy, well-adjusted lives. One ended up in prison, two ended up in prison. And one, when I asked about him some years later to somebody who was still in town, 
I asked, how's Jerry? And he said, which one? And because Jerry was profoundly schizophrenic and the split, the split, the division, the divisions in his life had led to a split within himself where he was no longer an integrated person but had multiple personalities, some that could be violent. And so we have an example here that should not be all that unfamiliar to us of this man who wears no clothes, who is the people of the town are afraid of him because he seems not only a danger to himself but to everybody else. And they have him in chains, but he can break the chains. And he seems to know things. He seems to, and he's, thro he's throwing himself on the ground. He's harming himself. He's engaged in self-harm. And he's living in the caves, which are tombs, by himself. And this is the one that they come to encounter. I mean, I think I've seen this man on West 7th Street yelling at nobody present. But Yeshua comes and goes to him. I mean, I don't think would have had to, but did. And in the encounter, in the encounter, he engages not just the man, but whatever spiritual presence or presences are occupying him now. Because at this point, he is fully possessed. Not self-possessed, but spiritually possessed. Where he habitually and always is deciding for harm. It's as though he can't do otherwise anymore. And Yeshua encounters him and engages. First of all, sees him. Sees him. Doesn't just walk by, but engages him and asks him his name. And he responds, and this is where it gets really interesting on the mythic level, because he responds, legion, which means many also, but the more common way a person in that time would hear it is Roman soldiers, Roman occupation, the legions. This area was under the occupation of Roman armies who oppressed, who pillaged and raped, who violently suppressed any hint of insurrection, as we know in the Jesus story. Legion. We are legion. And then, of course, there's the pigs. Now, this makes the story almost a, a little bit humorous in a Jewish setting, because pigs, of course, are unclean. So they're in a Gentile land. The legions are referred to in the name of, naming of the demons. They cry out, please don't send us back to hell or to the abyss. And instead, they ask to be sent into the pigs, the unclean animals, which happens. And then they rush off into the water. I really encourage us to reflect on this metaphorically metaphorically, because that's the power and the truth in the story so many times in the Bible. But it would indicate something, this notion of the legions, that the way in which, whether we call it mental health, mental illness, or whether we call it possession, or whatever we call it, or however we understand it, it's all, it's not something totally from the outside of us, 
that's happening to us, but that there's a social element going on. We don't just have individuals who are mentally ill. We have mental illness that gets manifested in individuals. The possession of the people by Rome and the Roman legions is manifesting in the possession of this poor individual who probably made poor choices that led to a full-on possession where he could do no other. But what sets him free? And this is the key. Is it Jesus only? Is it the name of Jesus? I mean, these are things that people talk about in terms of delivering people from spirits even today. Or is it the power of being seen with compassion and love? And more than that, is it the power of this particular someone, Yeshua, who was able to see the person inside? Kind of like Michelangelo, who always said he could see the sculpture whole inside the block of marble. Yeshua saw the essential person, the person who was still whole inside all of that power and influence that had such a hold on him. Because when it says that the people came out and they were afraid, <laughs> they were afraid of that guy, now they're afraid of whoever it was who could like, you know, deal with that guy. They, um, they saw him clothed, and in his right mind. Which we must assume he always had in there somewhere. We have choices. We have decisions to make. But a lot of those choices and decisions are really, if you think about it, essentially what they are is it's not my decision. It's actually an agreement that we make. We make agreements with the world around us, with the others around us, with the spiritual milieu in which we live. We make agreements. And some of those agreements are very good and true. And some of them can be very bad and harmful. We do this with ourselves. And it's so possible and tempting at times to make agreements that lie to us about who we are and what we are. You're no good. You're not valuable. You're not lovable. You're not interesting. You're not worthy. If only you had. And it's these agreements that can start really small and really early in our life. These agreements that we make that can lead us ultimately to believe that we're worthless.
and can lead us to have zero care what happens to us or to anyone else. And we can become trapped in that frame. This is what happened, I believe, to this man in the story. It happens all the time, and it happens to all of us somewhat. And it's out of that false sense of self that we then become co-harmers engaged in spiritual destruction rather than spiritual creation. Because we don't know who we are and we've lost touch with our essential self. But that essential self is never gone and never destroyed. And as long as there's tomorrow, there's hope through forgiveness, which means to let go of the fundamental sin, which is the fundamental mistake, having made agreements that have led us into falsehood. So as we look out into the world, I encourage us to begin to see others not as others, but as expressions of God whose essential selves are essentially good, essentially love. However twisted up people have, may, have become, however tormented, twisted, mistaken, and let us see with compassion, realizing that we're all in the same thing together, and we can be co-healers or not. With the genius of God.
singing 466. rise if you're able for the prayers. <clears throat> and guiding and empowering creative spirit, we pray for fathers, teachers, nurses, doctors, friends, and family. We pray for those who care for others. <clears throat> we give thanks for them and we pray that they would see and draw out and help to deliver those in their care God, in your mercy. Help us to experience our oneness. To expand in our sense of self. And to realize that ourselves does not end at the border of our skin. God, in your mercy, Give us compassion for ourselves and for others. God, in your mercy. Give us the power to make the decisions that lead to life for ourselves and for others. God, in your mercy.
We pray for those in power whose decisions are consequential for many. Deliver them from all selfish greed and self-centeredness and falsehood. Give them wisdom to see truth and to make decisions that lead to life for the many, God, in your mercy. Help us to feel now your presence as we express within ourselves or out loud concerns and cares Sharon Juen. Into your hands, O Creator and Redeemer, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ. Amen. The peace of God be with us all.
in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table is prepared and everyone is welcome.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep us in his grace through Christ. Amen. Uh, so announcements, uh, <clears throat> Jerry. Is, uh, has been planning to do uh, a gallery showing every Thursday night, and now it's gonna be by appointment only because there haven't been quite enough people to justify all that time set aside. So by appointment only, but also uh, we're glad to announce that Jerry applied for and received a $5,000, I think it's called a Blue Line grant, but it's for <laughs> local artists to expand their outreach into the community. So 5,000 bucks and he's gonna take his show on the road to North Minneapolis, I understand. Okay, so congrats. Yeah, absolutely. Jerry, thanks everybody for being part of this. And also I wanna connect Jerry and Carol, because Carol would like to have her picture taken, Jerry. So maybe you can talk to her after the service. Happy Father's Day, whatever you're doing. Uh, blessings upon your families. Um, and upon the memories of a lot of us whose fathers have passed on and remain with us only in spirit. So, blessed memory. Um, what else we got? We gotta get a council meeting. Council meeting this Tuesday, 6 o'clock via Zoom. Uh, you know, we've got to do our business, take care of our business and our housekeeping and our, our visioning and all of that good stuff. Uh, you can see that things are coming along. Uh, the floor has even, like, started to get patched. I don't know what possessed whoever, but I'm guessing he sits back there and wears a hat. Um, but... Uh, Whatever possessed us, whatever possessed us. So it's all good, it's all good, creative spirit. Um, I think that may be it. Is there something else you had in mind? Kelly, who apparently was hospitalized. We'll find out, I'll try to find out more about Kelly, but prayers for Kelly, uh, as well as Sharon Juen, um, who is going to be undergoing surgery to remove cancer. Uh, on the 29th of June, so please uh, keep her in mind and in heart and in prayer. Okay, let's sing our way out.
May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine on us and be gracious to us. And may God's countenance be lifted up upon us, giving us peace. Amen. Go in peace, love in the world.